Tonight, breaking news. The special counsel just appointed to investigate former President Donald Trump. Attorney General Merrick Garland tapping a veteran prosecutor to take over two probes into the deadly January 6th riot and the handling of classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. The move coming just days after Trump launched his re-election campaign. How the former president is now responding. Also tonight, the monster storm pummeling the Great Lakes. Buffalo buried under feet of snow, whiteout conditions making travel treacherous. The storm far from over. Bill Karen standing by with a full forecast. Swift justice. Taylor Swift breaking her silence after that ticket sale fiasco. What the pop superstar is saying in a message to her fans. Plus, a newly revealed DOJ investigation into Ticketmaster. What we're learning about the probe. Judgment Day, the stunning decision handed down late today. Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes sentenced to 11 years in prison for defrauding investors. The emotional moments in court and the reaction pouring in. Plus, driver release outrage. The suspect accused of plowing into a group of sheriff's recruits allowed to walk out of jail. Why police let him go just one day after charging him. And mass exodus. Hundreds of employees resigning from Twitter after Elon Musk laid down a harsh ultimatum. So are there enough people left to keep the social media giant running? Top Story starts right now. Good evening, I'm Gabe Gutierrez in for Tom. We begin top story tonight with that breaking news, the announcement from the Department of Justice involving former President Donald Trump. Attorney General Merrick Garland naming an independent special counsel to take over two ongoing investigations into the former president. The first, the possible mishandling of classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago residence. The second, his role in the deadly January 6th Capitol riot and possible efforts to impede the transfer of power after the 2020 election. The man assigned to lead the probes, Jack Smith, a veteran lawyer who most recently worked as a war crimes prosecutor at The Hague. Smith is now the second special counsel tasked with investigating Donald Trump after Robert Mueller. Trump blasting the appointment today, calling it a disgrace and the political stunt. Our justice correspondent, Ken Delanian, is following it all and leads us off tonight. A dramatic new turn tonight in the criminal investigations of former President Donald Trump. Attorney General Merrick Garland appointing a special counsel to oversee the two probes, saying it was best for the country. That it is in the public interest to appoint a special counsel. Such an, uh, an appointment underscores the department's commitment to both independence and accountability in particularly sensitive matters. Jack Smith will supervise the investigation into classified documents taken to Trump's Mar-a-Lago compound and whether there was obstruction of justice. He will also oversee the January 6th probe into efforts to interfere with the lawful transfer of power after the 2020 election, including what led up to the January 6th riot. Does this signal that criminal charges against Donald Trump have not been ruled out by the Department of Justice? It seems to me that he's the subject of a federal criminal investigation. That suggests charges have not been ruled out. In an interview with Fox News, Trump denounced the move and accused Smith without evidence of bias against him, saying they found nothing and now they take some guy who hates Trump. This is a disgrace. Jack Smith saying in a statement tonight that he will exercise independent judgment and will move the investigations forward expeditiously, including any prosecutions that may result from them. Smith began his career as a line prosecutor in New York before heading the Justice Department's anti-corruption unit. Since 2018, he has been serving as chief prosecutor in a special international court in The Hague investigating war crimes in Kosovo. Special counsels are independent, but they're not completely independent. But Garland said Smith will decide whether to bring criminal charges. Former Vice President Mike Pence urging caution in an interview with NBC's Chuck Todd. Is he above the law? I mean, if he... If he violated the law, should he be held to the same standard that well, I would be held to? Chuck, no one's above the law. But I, I would hope the Justice Department would give careful consideration uh, before they take any additional steps uh, in this matter. And Ken Delanian joins us now live, as well as NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. And Ken, we heard the attorney general there cite the extraordinary circumstances that called for a special counsel. But let's take a listen to more of his remarks. Based on recent developments 
including the former president's announcement that he is a candidate for president in the next election, and the sitting president's stated intention to be a candidate as well, I have concluded that it is in the public interest to appoint a special counsel. And Ken Garland is going out of his way here to insulate the DOJ. No matter what, this will be politicized, but did this comment inadvertently add fuel to the fire? Well, Justice Department officials would say that fire is going to rage no matter what they say. Garland was really articulating the reason that there is a perceived conflict of interest. If Trump wasn't running and Biden wasn't running, it wouldn't be as much of a conflict. But they think that their independence will be questioned since ultimately Merrick Garland, in a sense, works for Joe Biden. And that's why they made this move. Gabe. And Danny, bring some legal perspective into this. What kind of powers and independence does a special counsel actually have? Well, a special counsel is independent, but it is still technically part of the DOJ. They will operate outside of Maine justice at a uh, place probably yet to be disclosed, and they'll have their own sovereign, sovereign kind of power. And yet, they are still part of the Department of Justice. Just as we saw with Mueller, they will op operate independently. You might see people on the team who are former prosecutors in private practice who have come back into the fold. So uh, they are a kind of mini Justice League operating all on their own, but ultimately kind of tethered back to the Justice Department. And Ken, we have one special counsel now for two investigations. Will this cause any type of delay? What kind of timetable are we looking at here? Both Garland and Smith promised today that this would not cause a delay. Legal experts say the Mar-a-Lago case is pretty far along and could be resolved fairly quickly. The January 6th case is a bit of a wild card, though. It could uh, move rather rapidly, but it also could really bog down. It's a complicated investigation. It could even drag into the 2024 election campaign. Okay. And Danny, this is not the first special counsel that Trump has faced. The Mueller investigation, of course, was a key point of tension during the Trump presidency. So how might this investigation play out any differently? It's not the first special counsel investigation, but you could argue that the Mueller investigation unearthed new information. We all waited with bated breath to see who he would indict and what would be in the report. You could argue that both with January 6th and the documents fiasco that there have already been a lot of investigations, especially of January 6th. I envision the special counsel picking up a lot of traits from investigators like the uh, congressional committee who've already been working on this. So too has DOJ been conducting their own investigation. So to some degree, special counsel is going to be picking up where others, many others, have already left off. And finally, Ken, I want to ask you about some of your reporting that I heard uh, earlier on today. You said that some of your sources didn't think that this was a good idea. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, that's right. A lot of legal experts argued against this, saying that this doesn't really get the Justice Department anything because this person, J Jack Smith, is going to be criticized. Donald Trump is already saying he hurts Trump. And as Danny articulated, the special counsel still works for the Justice Department. And ultimately, while he will have charging authority, Merrick Garland, in theory, could block charges from happening, could fire this person. So he's not really independent in the sense of the old independent counsel law. And that's why people said, uh, argued against it. But Merrick Garland has made his decision, Gabe. Ken Delaney and Danny Savalas, thank you so much. Now to tonight's other top story, the state of emergency as parts of upstate New York are buried by that massive and deadly snowstorm. Four feet of snow already falling in some areas, multiple vehicles stuck, some out of gas, and lake effect snow warnings continue into Sunday. Jesse Kirch is in upstate New York. Jesse, what's the situation like there? Well, Gabe, right now you can see we're in a bit, bit of a lull, but make no mistake, this storm is far from over. It is expected to stretch into Sunday. You can see some people making their way through this neighborhood on foot. That is how officials would want people on the move if they have to go anywhere. They are pleading with people to stay off of the roads. And unfortunately, this storm has turned deadly. Officials tell us that two people suffered cardiac events tied to shoveling snow. And again, they are pleading with people to stay home. Icy roads. I wasn't expecting this. Bitter cold and feet of snow. And it's bad out here. With the storm far from finished. Definitely going to, have to be out here tomorrow. It's going to be like this all night. Across western New York, people trying to navigate near whiteout conditions, despite officials warning them to stay indoors. If you don't have to go out, don't go out. Car after car spinning out and stranded on the side of the road. Even an ambulance stuck, getting help from passersby. 
There was tow trucks here trying to pull them out with ropes, but it wasn't working, so they're still stuck. For nearly 24 hours, snow has been pummeling the Buffalo area, falling sometimes at more than three inches an hour, with visibility going from good to near zero in just minutes. Here in Lackawanna, New York, just south of Buffalo, they're moving snow by the truckload. Police say they need to make space here with even more snow on the way. The massive and quick accumulation raising the risk of roof collapse as some race to clear off the fresh snow. Orchard Park, New York, is already seeing four and a half feet. Hamburg, New York, topping four. The police chief there talking with us by video call because it's too dangerous for our team to drive there in person. When people drive and they get stuck, that causes a log jam that really inhibits our ability to, to clear the streets so that we can open up uh, sooner. Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania also hit by the snowstorm triggered by Arctic air that's keeping temperatures nationwide 10 to 30 degrees below average. And back in Buffalo, even with the Bills game moved out of town, some fans are still focused on Sunday. This is great football weather. <laughs> great football weather. Gotta love Bills fans. Jesse Kirch back with us now live. And Jesse, you've been reporting from the area since late yesterday. From what you've seen, what is making this storm so especially dangerous? Yeah, there are a couple of things, Gabe. First of all, we've talked about this in the story. It's that rapid accumulation, so that raises the risk that roofs could collapse. So that's something people need to be keeping an eye out for. Also, with this lake effect snow, it's very possible that one minute you could be in a relatively clear area. For example, right now, I can see well down the street. But I wouldn't be surprised if minutes from now, uh, the band of snow picks back up, comes through here, and visibility drops to near zero. We have seen that oscillation throughout the last 24 hours. And certainly if you are on the road, not to mention the traction issues you might have on the roadways, that visibility issue could be a real concern as well, Gabe. And Jesse, we're getting close to the peak of Thanksgiving travel. So how is all this snow set to affect people's holiday plans? Yeah, so one of the major stressors on police today, according to the Hamburg police chief in the area I spoke with, was having to deal with people who were having car issues who had been on the roads and probably shouldn't have been. So that's one more reason for you to stay home instead of trying to make your way out onto the roads because police say that makes it easier for them if you're off the road for the streets to get cleared by the plows and that will help get the cleanup going faster here in Lackawanna as we showed earlier. They've had to pick up snow by the truckload and move it to try to get it out of the way. Thankfully, this storm should be wrapping up before Thanksgiving, but obviously there's going to be a lot of digging out still to be done here, Gabe. And Jesse Kirch, live for us in upstate New York. Jesse, stay warm. And as Jesse mentioned there, the storm is not even close to finish. So let's bring in NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens. So, Bill, time this one out for us. How much more snow is this area expected wild, to get right? this, this weekend? To say you've had four and a half yeah. feet and we're like, you're going to get some more. Uh, this is obviously historic, crippling, paralyzing, however you want to say it. And we just had our highest snowfall total yet that just came in and we're in the orchard park area which is where the bills are located and we are up to now 59 inches of snow i mean that is pretty incredible stuff here um and as far as what we're going to deal with as we go throughout the next couple days is not this i mean this was incredible 59 that's almost up to 60 inches we're almost up to five feet but hamburg is also 51 so not just one city either so we'll have to wait and see if this breaks the record by the way the new york state record is 50 inches in a 24-hour period so they'll investigate this to see if it was accurately measured. And if so, we'll have a new record for New York State for snowfall in 24 hours. So here's what else that we're going to be talking about. We're getting a break. We saw where Jesse was located right here. The snow is now south to him. It will come back northwards later. So we're not completely done. We will see some additional snow, especially late tonight and then tomorrow. Here's how much additional snow over the weekend. Buffalo, 15 inches. Hamburg, around 14 inches. You get the idea. It's been feast or famine. Rochester, New York's only had like an inch or two, and they're only going to get another inch or two. So it's really had to be close to the lakes. And that's the same, too, off of Lake Ontario. Even Syracuse hasn't gotten a lot of snow to this point yet. Areas off of Lake Michigan, though, have gotten some, especially Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo. So what are we going to deal with as we go throughout your weekend? Everyone's getting ready for their holiday plans, whether it's buying stuff, cooking stuff, or traveling. The rest of the country looks pretty good. Rain down along the Gulf Coast. But you notice we don't have any other storms. So if you're not driving near the lakes, your weather is actually going to be pretty ideal. By the time we get 
to Sunday. We watch this rainfall exiting the south. It'll be a little bit in Florida and still some snow showers up here. But I mean, I've seen much worse forecasts for holiday travel. So this looks pretty good away from Buffalo. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that record breaking snowfall and potentially and yes, and uh, still more to come. Bill Karens, thank you so much. And antitrust concerns over Ticketmaster and Live Nation are now taking center stage. So what could this investigation mean for the entertainment giant? I want to bring in former prosecutor and veteran criminal defense attorney Mark Eichlarsch. And Mark, we don't yet know the full scope of this investigation or what initially kicked it off, but what do you think the DOJ will be looking for here? Well, this investigation is not because 10 million Swifties didn't get their precious tickets. It's to determine whether Live Nation abused their market power, whether they broke any laws at all, or whether they violated any of the restrictions placed on them as a result of their merger. And Mark, you know, as you said, this is not about the Taylor Swift situation, but how does that play into this, if at all? One stat caught my attention. Swift would need to perform 900 stadium shows or one show for every night, every night for two and a half years to meet demand here. So is there any way yeah. to unravel this? Do fans have any recourse? And do you think that there might be a case for some sort of class action lawsuit? Well, I'll say this with certainty. There's definitely lawyers considering a class action lawsuit. Every one of us, whether it be attorneys, investigators, and even Department of Justice investigators, they are human and they have kids. And those kids are really disappointed that their daddy or mommy didn't get them Taylor Swift tickets, or in my case, Springsteen tickets. So I think there's a lot of anger there. I think there's a potential violation of the law, and I say potential. And there's deep pockets, all the fixings that you need for a good class action suit. Definitely a lot of anger and frustration among some fans. So, Mark, what do you see happening here? Do you think Ticketmaster and Live Nation could be forced to split up or will the DOJ maybe just slap a big fine on it? So I don't have a crystal ball, but here are the three generic options. Number one, they say nothing. You did nothing wrong here. Mm -hmm. Secondly, because it's the Department of Justice, they oversee civil investigations, meaning over money, so they could be hit with a huge fine and greater restrictions, or they also oversee criminal investigations. So if they did anything at all that violated any criminal statute, they could be facing indictment. Mark, thank you. Now to late breaking news out of Silicon Valley, a federal judge today sentencing Elizabeth Holmes, founder of the failed blood testing company Theranos, to more than 11 years in prison. She had been found guilty of lying to investors about the company's technology and financial health. NBC's Nyella Charles has more. Good luck, Elizabeth. Today, Elizabeth Holmes facing her judgment day. A pregnant home scene walking into court this afternoon where a judge sentenced her to more than 11 years behind bars. In tears, she apologized to her investors and patients. Holmes was convicted of federal charges of fraud for deceiving investors for more than $900 million, including former top government officials. Federal prosecutors recommended a 15-year prison sentence, her attorneys asking for no prison time. The founder and CEO of the failed blood testing company Theranos was once considered by some to be the face of a new age of technology, Forbes naming her the youngest female self-made billionaire in 2014. The former face of the future, now the face of fraud. Falsely claiming that with just one drop of blood, her technology could run hundreds of blood tests. First they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. Holmes' legal team submitted 130 letters to the judge from friends, family, and other supporters. Holmes' husband writing she is honest, humble, selfless, and kind begging the judge to let her be free. Even Senator Cory Booker asking for a lenient sentence, writing she possesses the capacity to redeem herself. Holmes pleaded not guilty, blaming her ex-boyfriend, former Theranos CEO, Ramesh Sunny Balwani. He has denied the version of events. She thought that she couldn't be held accountable, that she thought that she could tell investors anything, that she could tell institutions and financial uh, agencies whatever she wanted to and not be held accountable. And that's just false. The convicted mother will begin her sentence in April 2023. And Nyella Charles joins us now live from Los Angeles. And Nyella, is it rare to see tech executives charged with fraud? 
Right, Gabe. It's rare for a tech executive to be charged with fraud, but even more rare for a tech executive to be convicted, let alone serving prison time. Here, federal prosecutors are sending a clear message that they don't condone this type of behavior. Not only are they sending that message to Elizabeth Holmes, but they're also sending a big warning to the industry as a whole. Federal prosecutors say that Elizabeth Holmes' case is one of the worst cases of white-collar crimes in the history of Silicon Valley. Gabe? And Nayala, did Holmes' pregnancy seem to factor into her sentencing at all? Gabe, that part's not really clear, but she did walk into court today pregnant. It doesn't seem like the judge took a lenient stance considering the decision is not too far away from what prosecutors recommended, which was 15 years in prison. Gabe? Nayala, thank you. Next to a major turmoil at Twitter, the tech giant seeing a mass exodus of employees after Elon Musk issued an ultimatum demanding employees commit to a, quote, hardcore work environment or leave. The billionaire now reportedly asking engineering staff to come into the San Francisco headquarters despite a company-wide email last night saying the offices will be closed until Monday. And for more on what's really going on behind the scenes, I want to bring in Ryan Mack. He's a technology reporter for The New York Times. And Ryan, multiple internal emails show Musk asking engineers to show him the best code they've written and even asking him to fly to San Francisco last minute and meet with him in person. So does it seem like there are enough people still working at Twitter to keep the tech giant running for now? You know, that's a bit of a mystery at this point, but there have been a lot of people that have left. We're still waiting for final counts to come in. But, you know, this comes after he's already laid off half the company earlier this month. He laid off about, there's about 3,700 people that were laid off. And of that, you know, remainder 3,700, a lot of people resigned yesterday, not opting in to his, quote, Twitter 2.0, his hardcore vision for Twitter, where, you know, you're going to have to commit long hours, potentially sleep in the office, and, you know, work to make this thing profitable again for him. And um, a lot of folks, you know, departing over that. And Ryan, there's been a lot of fast-moving developments on the story today. Musk tweeted just a couple hours ago, and he said that a new Twitter policy is freedom of speech, but not freedom of reach. Negative hate tweets will be max deboosted and demonetized, so no ads or other revenue to Twitter. You won't find the tweet uh, unless you specifically seek it out, which is no different than the rest of the internet. So um, he also wrote that Kathy Griffin, Jordan Peterson, and the Babylon have been reinstated, and a decision on former President Trump being reinstated has not yet been made. But Musk noticeably didn't define hate speech. So is this policy likely to just change again, Ryan? It's possible. I mean, he's making up rules on the fly. You know, a couple weeks ago, he was talking about a, you know, council to oversee changes and to there be no content changes until that council has reviewed it. Obviously, he is not doing that anymore. He's letting people back onto the platform kind of at will. And um, he's making things up on the fly. You know, it's also a kind of a crash course in content moderation for him. You know, he came in buying this platform, saying there'd be more free speech, more more speech would reign on the platform. And he's getting starting to realize that advertisers are not happy with that. They're pulling back, they're they're closing their pocketbooks, and they're not going to, you know, uh, allow their content or ad content to be seen next to, you know, some of the speech that he, he wanted to permit. And picking up on that point, Ryan, I want to bring up an op-ed written by the former head of trust and safety at Twitter, who said that this was the reason he left. Quote, a Twitter whose policies are defined by unilateral edict has little need for a trust and safety function dedicated to its principal development. So along the lines that you mentioned, is content moderation just falling apart at Twitter? Well, you had, along with those employees that were laid off, a lot of contractors that were also um, laid off earlier this month, um, a lot of those folks deal with content moderation. The person that wrote that op-ed, Yoel Roth, was someone who was actually elevated and highlighted by Mr. Musk when advertisers started to pull out saying, you know, this is a guy who's leading our content moderation policies. He is, we're, we're setting the standards here. And it's kind of, you know, telling that, you know, Yoel would leave and then also write an op-ed basically um, impugning, you know, Musk and, and his, his policies. So it's, it's quite a disaster if you, if you look at it, yeah. Ryan Mack from the New York Times. Ryan, thank you so much.
Let's turn now to the investigation into the killings of four University of Idaho students and the chilling new insights we're learning as a community gathers to mourn and frustration grows among family members with still no break in the case. Our Gotti Schwartz is there. As investigators continue to find evidence five days after a horrific quadruple killing at this Idaho home, a dramatic new revelation from the county coroner. At least one of the victims was killed in their bed. Tonight, the family of Kaylee Gonzalez left with few answers. My husband is in contact with them every day, the FBI, Moscow, Idaho State Police, and every day he just says, nothing, babe. And I'm like, nothing? And he's like, nothing. I mean, just nothing. Police releasing a map showing where the victims were in the approximate hours before their deaths, asking the public for any information. We're doing the fastest job, the most thorough job, though, that we can to hold the integrity of this case and maintain that. Officials say there was no sign of forced entry. Their house had a keypad lock. It was a very popular house, so I, I know for a fact that people who weren't necessarily roommates of the house did have that code. So no sign of forced entry doesn't necessarily mean that they were invited in. With the FBI now joining the investigation, police say two other roommates were also home at the time of the murders, but survived uninjured and are cooperating. And with the suspect still at large, a mother's plea to her daughter's killer. Stop, Stop all this. Let us mourn our children, and we can't when we know this person is out there. You know who did it. You, you know who you are. Just end it. The guilt has got to be just overwhelming. It's got to no be hiding. sickening. Stop hiding. Stop running. Just turn yourself in. And Gotti Schwartz joins us now live from Idaho. And Gotti, we just saw that emotional plea from one of the victim's mothers at the end of that piece. How are the families holding up? Uh, well, well, Kaylee's mom told me something that is absolutely heartbreaking. She said that her biggest fear right now is that the killer that is still out there will show up to to her daughter's funeral or will show up to one of these vigils and be standing there next to the family as they're trying to mourn uh, their loved one. And that's something that all the families are dealing with right now. There's so much uncertainty, so much fear in this town uh, with this killer still on the loose. It must be terrifying, Gotti. What more are we learning from the new details like the time frame and the map of where the victims were before they were killed? What, what more are we learning from that? Yeah, so that map came out right before we went to, to, to meet with the family. And we were asking them about that map because that family has been so diligent about building their own timeline. And I got to say, a couple of them raised their eyebrows when we started comparing notes in terms of uh, time stamps and where uh, people were. I asked them about it. They said that they think that cops are doing the best they can and they think that they're just trying to get more information. But when you actually look at some of the time stamps that the family has gotten from things like cell phone records and things like uh, Ubers dropping people off, they don't really match with what police are saying. They're off by about 10, 5, 10, 15 minutes. And so the, the family is very worried that when it comes to details in a case like this, everything matters. And so they're hoping that people uh, cooperate with police. They're hoping that people will come forward with more information, but they are definitely hoping that P uh, the police are making sure that every T is crossed, every I is dotted, and every piece of evidence is gathered in this case. Back to you. A huge mystery that is still unfolding. Gotti Schwartz, live for us in Idaho. Gotti, thank you. Still ahead tonight, driver release outrage. The suspect accused of plowing into a group of sheriff's recruits released from jail. Why police let him go one day after they said they thought the crash was intentional. Plus, the measles outbreak in Ohio. Two dozen children sicken. The request tonight from health officials in that state. And a piece of movie history up for sale. The house from the Goonies, now in the market. So how much will it cost? Stay with us. We're back now with an update on that crash in Los Angeles County where 25 sheriff's recruits were injured. The alleged driver out of jail and back at home despite officials saying the crash might have been intentional. Steve Patterson has the latest. 
Why did you run into the recruits? Tonight, an unexpected move in an already tragic incident. The driver, suspected of running down 25 sheriff recruits in Los Angeles Wednesday, released from the county jail. Can anyone give us a comment? A lot of people want answers. Officials say Nicholas Gutierrez was released due to insufficient evidence. The 22-year-old was initially arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after authorities say he veered into the wrong lane, striking dozens of recruits on a morning run. Their injuries include head trauma, broken bones, and loss of limbs. The sheriff's office says two recruits remain in critical condition. It's a tragic event, very traumatic for all people involved. We airlifted the families to get them to the hospital so they could visit their loved one. Deputies describing the aftermath as a chaotic scene. It looked like an airplane wreck. There were so many bodies scattered everywhere in different states of injury. Security camera footage from a nearby resident's property capturing the moment Gutierrez's Honda CRV headed towards four columns of recruits dressed in white shirts as they jogged in formation. Investigators say a field sobriety test found that Gutierrez had no alcohol in his system during the collision. But yesterday, L.A. County Sheriff Alex Villanueva said that detectives, quote, have provided probable cause to believe that this was intentional, in contrast to the initial charge of attempted murder of peace officers. Why did you run into the recruits? Though he's been released, Gutierrez may not be off the hook. Officials say the investigation continues as they work with the district attorney's office. And it is entirely possible that Gutierrez is rearrested pending new charges if investigators determine intent. But for now, he remains home. Gabe? Steve, thank you. When we come back, High Seas Shootout. The suspected drug smuggling ship intercepted off the coast of Puerto Rico. What happened when those on board opened fire? Back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with a Customs and Border Protection agent killed in a shootout off the coast of Puerto Rico. The Department of Homeland Security says three agents encountered a, sus a suspected smuggling vessel and exchanged gunfire with two suspects on board. All three agents were shot, and one of the agents died of his injuries, along with one of the suspects. A second suspect was arrested, and the FBI is now investigating. The FBI is also investigating the death of a North Carolina woman in Mexico. 25-year-old Shanquella Robinson died less than 24 hours after she arrived in Cabo San Lucas on a vacation with friends. Her family says they were originally told she died from alcohol poisoning, but that they were later given an autopsy report that stated her neck was broken. Health officials in Ohio are asking the CDC for help in containing a measles outbreak. Columbus, Ohio, has reported at least 24 cases of measles, the majority of them in children under five. The health department confirmed all of the children were unvaccinated. At least nine of them have been hospitalized. The outbreaks happened across nine daycare centers and two schools. And the house featured in the classic 1985 movie, The Goonies, is up for sale. A two-story Victorian home in Astoria, Oregon, is listed for $1.6 million. It was the location of several of the film's iconic scenes, but any buyer should prepare for company. Thousands of fans flock to the area around the home every year during the annual Goondocks Festival. And now to a major headline in sports and a controversy that has many soccer fans outraged. Just days before the World Cup kicks off in Qatar, the Arab nation banning alcohol sales at the stadiums, despite Budweiser sponsoring the event. Here's Megan Fitzgerald. With passionate fans and players around the world descending on Qatar. Tonight, a sudden reversal from Qatari officials announcing beer will be banned inside stadiums in the conservative Muslim country, despite Budweiser's $75 million sponsorship. For me, beer and football go hand in hand. A shroud of controversy has long loomed over this tournament, with a small Gulf nation under extreme scrutiny for its track record on human rights. Qatar spent billions to modernize ahead of the World Cup, work often done in brutal conditions and sweltering heat by migrant laborers from countries like Nepal and India. 
Human rights groups say thousands of workers have died since Qatar was named as host a decade ago. There have been historical abuses of the, for the past 10 years, be it those who died, be it those who were injured, be it those who lost their wages to construct and build, prepare Qatar, deliver on this World Cup. Qatar's government has not responded to NBC News's request for comment. Officials have previously said they are committed to engaging collaboratively and constructively to further improve standards for all migrant workers in Qatar. The country is also under serious scrutiny for its treatment of LGBTQ people. Same-sex relationships are illegal here. In a statement to the AP, Qatar's government said it does not tolerate discrimination against anyone. But first known Qatari to publicly come out as gay, Dr. Naz Mohammed has a warning for fans. The message for them right now is to honestly just watch out for their safety. USA! USA! A million USA, fans are expected USA, here, USA. where 32 teams will play 64 games over the next four weeks. Football is a game for, for everyone, and everybody can, can play it at some level. Gabe, despite the controversy, I can tell you there's a lot of excitement here in Qatar. You can feel it at the airport. Fans arriving in their team's jersey, already cheering. Gabe? Mega, thank you. Coming up, critical pipelines sabotaged? Holes discovered in two pipelines that bring oil from Russia to most of Europe. The shocking discovery investigators just made next. Back now with Top Stories Global Watch. The Biden administration says Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has immunity in the killing of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The White House backing the Crown Prince's claim that in his new role as prime minister, it shields him from a lawsuit brought by Khashoggi's wife and a rights group. In a statement, the Washington Post blasting the Biden administration, saying they gave MBS a, quote, license to kill. Swedish investigators say they found traces of explosives in the Nord Stream pipelines. And authorities have been investigating four holes in Nord Stream, one and two that were discovered in September. The pipelines funnel gas from Russia to most of Europe. Swedish officials are calling explosions sabotage. Investigators are still determining who was responsible. And thanks so much for watching Top Story. For Tom Yamas, I'm Gabe Gutierrez in New York. Stay right there. More news now is on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.